we try to finish church as best as we could by one o'clock to give those traveling by subway an opportunity uh, to get going and those traveling back to Rochester uh, to be able to get home before it's too late. <clears throat> the time we're living in is a very serious time and when we look at uh, the scriptures there's so much so much in the Word of God to give us caution. In Matthew chapter 24 uh, Jesus made a statement and it is so important that we <clears throat> look at some of these things and consider the statements of scripture and see how best we can apply these areas to our lives. Matthew 24, um, you have a red letter edition Bible, it would have a lot of red in this particular chapter. Um, chapter 23, Jesus ended that Matthew ended that chapter by telling of how Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he was very sad. And in chapter 23, I think that's where we'll back up to and then move on forward. In chapter 23, Jesus cautioned uh, his people. He had a confrontation with the religious element of his time and he was not a Dale Carnegie type of person, even though he would put little children on his knees and, and set them on his lap and, and he would make a statement like, suffer little children to come unto me. He was very compassionate and yet at the same time very firm in what he maintained. Matthew chapter 23, he condemns the Pharisees. Uh, he made some statements like this in verse 13. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, I don't know how you'll convert people if they're standing there in front of you listening to you preaching to them, and you call them hypocrites. But he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees were the most religious people in that period of time. And they were the teachers. They were the ones that taught law. They were the ones that conducted an oversight over the, in the synagogues. And he says, For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. In other words, the religious people in any time could be the greatest obstacle for one's spiritual development. I listened to Brother Raleigh today and uh, he has a religious background. He told you about where he came from and where he was heading and the struggles he had in making decisions. Well, we all have religious backgrounds. Uh, my parents, my mom was, my dad was a Hindu originally. My mom, also from a pagan background, religion, uh, she was a Madras, and um, we grew up in more of an Anglican environment because by the time my mom and dad got together, they became Anglicans. And so as a young man, we grew up in Anglican, in the Anglican church. And the reason why my dad decided that we needed to go to Anglican church would be the most amazing reason well they had a big cemetery and if you're a member in the Anglican Church you can get a free plot and so dad joined the Anglican Church took us all so we all he had nine kids plus himself and mom that'll be 11 little plots you can get uh, to be buried uh, he did not realize that the church was the biggest tomb in the cemetery. Had more dead people inside than outside. But we grew up there and I can't condemn the past that I came on because it takes the past to bring me to my present position. 
I don't curse the bridges I cross on. Might be a lousy bridge, but it brought me to where I am today. And I give God thanks for that. I cannot condemn the men who were my teachers of the past. They might not have known as much as we know today, but they did their jobs in bringing us to where we are. My mom never went to college, but she raised kids. My dad never went to the university, but he knew how to father his children. And so when I look back, Brother Raleigh had a heritage, and I have a heritage. And one day, I was about 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, and I came out of the Anglican church, and I saw the priest with a cigar, cigarette in one hand, a uh, cigarette in his left hand, shaking everybody's hand as they leave the church. His breath smelled alcohol. And a young man, I don't know, I didn't know it was if it was right or wrong to smoke and drink, but I told my mom, I said, Mom, can I go to a different church? And she didn't care. She said, yes, you can. So I wandered from Anglican Church to the church, Indiana Church of God. And my pastor was there. I used to go around with him. He had a motorcycle, and I used to ride behind him. we go for Sunday school and stuff like that. And from Church of God, long story short, I went a little bit to the Pilgrim Holiness. And they had, at that time, Brother Cherry might remember, they had something called Youth for Christ. And I was a part of the Youth for Christ uh, group. And then one day, I was privileged. I was about 12 years old. And I heard my first Pentecostal message preached to me. There was a, it was a community center that was used to house a crusade. And the pastor that was preaching that day, his name was Brother, he never called himself Reverend, but he says Brother Harry Das, an Indian man. And the man that conducted that crusade that night, his name was Dennis Hilliman. I was 12 years old. And when the service came to an end, they asked those who want to accept Jesus into their lives can come forward. I went. And that brought a change in my life from that day on. I became a serious Christian. And when I'm looking back, there's a lot of things I, I embraced. I became a member of the Full Gospel Fellowship of Churches in Guyana. And I appreciate that period of time. I had friends that were all ministers. And there was a time when I was about 21 years old. Just 21 years old. There were 12 little churches in a district I was in charge of. I wasn't married yet. Um, we got married when I was 22 years old. And Chandri was 20 at that time. But I was in charge of that district. Well, you know, there were things that I could never comprehend. I could never understand the doctrine of the Trinity. When, and I had problems in that organization because they said one plus one plus one is equal to one. And they said the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. I couldn't understand that either because I thought the father was the father and the son was a separate entity than the father and the son was lesser in power than the father and then he said my father is greater than I so I could not understand the doctrine of the Trinity and so when I asked my pastor in that time uh, can you explain this to me he said it's a mystery well last night we had a service that I talked about the mysteries of God. And Jesus said to his disciples, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And so we are here in church today to learn about the mysteries. Uh, they might be things we might never fully understand. But as long as we're here, we'll do our best to try to comprehend what God wants to teach us. And so when it comes to religion... I could be there as a religious leader, and I don't want you to leave my organization. I don't want you to move ahead to something more that demands more dedication and sacrifice because I want to keep my membership. 
And that is what the Pharisees were. They wanted to hold on to their people and get this little organization going and do the little mechanics of religion and hope that every member can remain a member. And Jesus was very blunt. He says, you hypocrites. He says, you would not enter in at this, at, at, into the kingdom and people that want to enter in, you hindered them. And so in the very next verse, he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 14, hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Somebody says, well, I pray very much. Well, if you pray, uh, how are you praying? Uh, there was a Pharisee and a publican, find that scripture for me, that went into the temple to pray. And uh, Jesus uh, made mention of this. He says this Pharisee and the publican went into a uh, temple to pray. And the Pharisee, the publican bowed his head because he was a sinner. And he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. But the Pharisee, he was more self-righteous in that he felt he was a better man uh, before God than the publican was. Somebody find that for me? And um, uh, when the Pharisee prayed, the scripture said the Pharisee who, Pharisee who prayed a longer prayer prayed with himself. You see, you can be saying prayers and not praying prayers. It's two different things. You could be praying in, to impress people around you uh, without sincerely talking to God. And um, have we found that? Luke chapter 18. Okay, thank you, Nadine. I've got it right in, in front of me. But it's always good to, um, to have individuals search their Bibles. And in Luke chapter 18 and verse 10, two men went into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, a religious man, and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And here is what he said. He's telling God. He says, God, I thank thee. I'm not like other men are. Uh, extortioners. He says, people are robbing people. I'm not like them. He says, unjust, I'm not an unjust man. He says, adulterers, he says, I don't, I'm not an adulterer. He says, and even as this man here, this publican, I'm not like this guy across there, he's a sinner. Now, can you imagine he's telling God all of this? And uh, he says, I fast twice in the week. I give thanks of all things that I, all that I possess. And then the Bible says, and the publican, um, standing afar off, he was a sinner, would not lift up as much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know what Jesus says? He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Who went justified? The publican, the sinner, because he was sincere. But this man that was very exalted, and that was the attitude of the Pharisees in that time, because they were religious. Uh, we've got to be careful that we are not branded as the Pharisees of the 21st century. Because we can have so much knowledge and so much understanding of Scripture uh, that uh, it could exalt us. If your religion makes you proud, and exalted, then your religion has done nothing for you. See, Brother Raleigh said he came here to die. He didn't mean he's coming here for Brother Singh to kill him. But what he meant is the carnal nature, the ungodliness in him, the, that which is rejected by God in him, he came here to give that up. And this is important. I'm here to die myself. And I've been dying for the past uh, 60 uh, years, uh, you know, I've been, almost 60 years I've been dying slowly to myself. I'm not what I used to be years ago. I look back at five years ago, I'm not what I was five years ago. I'm not what I was 10 years ago. I'm on a journey and I have a goal before me. And I hope to God that I'll continue to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God 
in Christ Jesus. And so here the Pharisee, the publican went home justified, but the Pharisees, the Pharisee did not. And so back here in Matthew 23, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisee, verse 15, you hypocrites. He says, you come past land and sea to make a convert, a proselyte. And when he is made, you make him a twofold child of hell than yourselves. He says, you're not qualified to preach and convert anybody. You see, he said, you were already a child of hell. You were already doomed because your religion did not amount to anything in the sight of God. And when you go out and you make a convert to your religion, he was once a child of hell, now you're making him a twofold child of hell like yourself. Jesus was very blunt. He was unapologetic in his approach in presenting the gospel. And so was all the prophets. So were the men of God in this Bible that I'm reading. Today, in the 21st century, we have men with butter up lips and soft speech, flamboyant talk that will not put anyone into the kingdom of God because they do not have the message and the bluntness of what is required to save individuals. John the Baptist, when he came on the scene, he says, you generation of vipers who warned you to flee from the rot to come. He was a very blunt man. Isaiah, when he came on the scene, he says, the ox knoweth his master and the ass his master's crib. He says, but Israel doth not know me. Israel doth not know God. And uh, this was the approach they have. Uh, they had back there. And so Jesus went on here in Matthew chapter 23. And then coming down to the end of that chapter, he said in verse 34, very sad areas of the word of God. He said in verse 34, he says, wherefore have I? And this is important for you to recognize because it showed a pre-existence of Christ. He says, wherefore have I sent unto you prophets? Now he's sitting here overlooking uh, the nation of Israel. He is addressing Israel. It says, uh, oh, he says, wherefore have I sent you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you have killed and crucified, and some of them you scourge in your synagogues, or you beat. He says, and persecute them from city to city. See, it is, it is important for us to understand that rejection is a part of what God's ministry must experience. Every prophet that God sent in this Bible was rejected. Every church that God started in your Bible eventually went to hell. The devil was successful in undermining everything that God started. And that is why when we are here today, we must not take the devil for granted. He doesn't come in the back door of the church looking like a red painted uh, creature. He comes in and gets into the hearts of the children of God. See, the devil can never make me do anything I do not want to do myself. He is as powerful as you allow him. Don't blame him for you sinning against God. You sin because you chose to do that. He can just tempt you, but you do it because you desire to do it. Don't say, Satan made me do it. No, he didn't. You did it because of your lust and carnal desires, and that is what Brother Raleigh meant when he says, I'm here to die. Yes, me too. It's one beggar telling the other beggar where to find bread. That's what we are doing here. I need God, you need God. I might be the doctor temporarily, but the doctor gets sick too. We're here, patient, all patients in a big hospital, trying to cope with each other's spiritual maladies until God saves us. Stick it out, don't give up. The cure is on its way. 
It's gradual, but it's progressive. And so Jesus said, I've sent you all kinds of prophets, but you kill them all. He says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Bacchus, whom you slew between the altar and the, the temple and the altar. He looked at a present generation 2,000 years ago. Jesus looked at the people that he was talking to and Jerusalem and he's making a, a statement. He says, you today that reject what God is doing, you're guilty for the rejection of every man of God starting from Abel. See, if I'm here today and God did send me, and that's for you to figure it out. If God did not send me and you're sitting here listening to me, you're damned. Because I've conned you. If God has sent me on the other hand and you're here listening to me, you need to listen to the word I preach and apply it to your hearts and not reject the word of God. Today, Paul said, if you would hear his voice, harden not your heart as Israel did. And they were destroyed. And so he went on here and he said, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. You see, 2,000 years ago, there was that generation Jesus was speaking to. And you would think that a great person like Jesus would convert everybody. No, he did not. The scripture says he came unto his own. And his own received him not. They rejected their Messiah. They killed the Savior of the world. The religious people rejected truth when it came to them. Not only did they kill Isaiah, not only did they reject the prophets of the Old Testament, not only did they persecute the apostles and killed and martyred almost every one of the apostles Christ sent out, but the religious people today will also destroy your faith. May God help us. May God help us that this assembly would not become such a self-righteous, hypocritical assembly that we feel we are better off than everybody else. Listen, we need God. You need God. I need God. We all need God. And it says here in verse 37, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee. He says, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not, you would not change, you would not repent, you would not turn to God. See, 2,000 years ago, he was there, and Jerusalem, the Jews, rejected him. Somebody says, well, pray for the saving, the healing of the Jews. Well, I do. I pray for the Jews. I pray for our prime minister. I pray for President Trump. I pray for all the leaders of the world. But our prime minister needs to be saved. I can't save him if God doesn't want him saved. President Trump needs to be saved, even though he has prayers in the White House. I can't save him. God must do that. We're busy saving ourselves. And when I look at the nation of Israel gathering back in the Mideast, Israel needs to be saved. It was the Jews that crucified Jesus. And I don't hold that against them because God doesn't hold that against them, but God must bring the Jews to repent and turn back to him. And as we look at the end of the age that we're living in, we are living at the very end of the age. Scripture tells us that God must bring all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Right now she's winning the little wars or that she fights around her neighborhood. But there's coming a time in our lifetime, in your lifetime and my lifetime, when she will start losing wars. According to Scripture. 
We're living at the very end of this age. And when Jesus said to Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thee? He says, behold, verse 38, your house, your kingdom, your, 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 your nation is left unto you desolate. You know what he saw? He saw the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. See, on his way to Golgotha, the women were crying while he was carrying the cross. And he says, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. And your children. And those Jews that rejected Christ. At his first coming. Resulted in the army of Titus. Marching against Jerusalem. And destroying not only the temple. But destroying every Jew they can find there. To put their hands on. And today. This world we are living in. Must be something we need to reckon with. And as you come here, it says in chapter 24, and because of time, I must be moving on with this lesson, but in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says in verse 36 about his second coming to this earth, his return. Remember when he went up into heaven and the angels appeared and says, This Jesus you see ascend into heaven shall come in like manner as you behold him going? Well, he must come. Jesus must return for a few things. One, he must come back to resurrect the righteous dead. I just made a statement. Listen to me carefully. He's coming back to resurrect the righteous dead. That means they are dead. Paul is dead. David is dead. Stephen is dead. Peter is dead. Jeremiah is dead. Isaiah is dead. Every man of God in the past, they're dead. And that is why he must come back and descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first. See, the church today has brought in pagan philosophies into the church. One of the pagan philosophies that we have brought into the church is that the soul is immortal. Not so. If the soul is immortal, it can die. And if it can die, then Jesus don't need to come to resurrect anybody because we are alive somewhere. So, Brother Raleigh, if you die before me, March, that's not for real. I'm just making a statement. But if you die before me and we put your casket up in front here and we're having, you know, that's what they do today. They make a show of the dead. In today's world, everything costs money. And when Brother Raleigh, if Brother Raleigh dies before me and I put his casket here, what you want to hear, Marge? Don't you cry, Marge. He's gone to be a bed in a better place. He's not here. He's gone to in a better place. Then you know what I'll ask you, Marge? You want to go there now? Join him? It's a better place. See, the fantasies we develop, it's all fantasies. Somewhere down the line, we've got to see reality. This is not a mother goose rhyme. The word, life is real. Death is real. Death have a sting. And one day when God resurrects us, we'll look back at the grave and say, Oh, death, where is thy sting? And, oh, grave, where is thy victory? Until that time when you die, you're dead until the resurrection comes. That's why Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth on him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's the hope we have in the church. Let's not believe in fantasies. We live in an age where every show they have has some fantasies in it. Well, we've got to face reality. 
And Jesus said here in John, in Matthew chapter 24, he says, But of that day and hour, verse 36, Know it no man, know not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. He says, My return, only the Father knows when I'm coming back. Don't listen to the preachers that got a date set. Jesus says, Only my Father, as it was in the days of no. Listen to this amazing a little scripture here. He says, But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days of Noah, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, and they were marrying and giving in marriage. Until the do day that Noah entered into the ark. Now here is a funny thing. <clears throat> Noah is a preacher of righteousness. He's got his big boat. 400 and something feet long. 75 feet wide. Three stories tall. Where do you think he got it? In his garage? No, he's got to find a nice open place to build it. Was that a hidden thing? No, he couldn't build it by himself. The people helped him to build it. But if rain never fell and flooded anywhere, who would believe that thing would sail? In the first year to see him building, and the second year to see him building, and he's building away. And Noah is building a boat, and there is no water to float it. He preached that God was going to flood the earth. But nobody believed him. Just like I preach that Jesus is coming back soon. And my people in this congregation, most of you don't believe that he's coming back soon. When we say we feel the presence of God, most of us don't believe it because we don't believe God is here on a Wednesday night. We put God on our own agenda and the devils believes, believe and they tremble. But you and I believe worse than the devil because he trembles. But we don't really believe when we say we believe God is there. See, if I believe God is in this service today, I wouldn't sleep. If I believe God is in this service today in this sanctuary, I wouldn't have my children run around. If I believe God is in his presence is here, I'll respect his presence. I wouldn't pull out gum from my pocket and be blowing bubbles while the pastor is preaching. I will respect this great king because this is his sanctuary. You want to disrespect it, go to the Muslim mosque. And if you can get through the front door with your shoe on, you are really lucky. The Muslims have respect for their temple, their mosque. The Hindus got respect for their temples. The Buddhists got respect for their temples. But our God is like a joker. His house is made Jesus whipped them out of the temple. He says, you made my father's house a den of thieves and robbers. Jesus respected the temple. We should respect the temple and we need to be real believers. Amen. See, the people in Noah's days, they did not believe the boat was going to ever float. Here's the sad part, verse 39. And they knew not. You mean, what didn't they know? That there was a boat? Yeah. They knew not that it was going to flood until the flood came and took them all away in death. Listen to me carefully. I'm about to bring this lesson to a close. We are living in a time that is like the days of Noah. Never before in the history of this planet has there been so many earthquakes like they are right now. Never before have we ever heard about five feet of ice 
falling in a place like Mexico. The world has gone crazy in its response to man's rebellion. And we and I, because of Hollywood and the kind of display of violence they have on television, we really don't believe all this thing is happening. Hundreds of people are dying. Thousands of people starve to death. Hurricanes and tornadoes such as never were hitting this planet. And you and I keep on living the way we can. Don't put God in priority. We are no different than the people in Noah's days. And the flood will take us away. Over in Isaiah chapter 24... I got five minutes. Over in Isaiah chapter 24, I preached a lesson a couple of weeks ago in showing you that the trumpets of Revelation, uh, Revelation 7, 8, the trumpets mentioned in Revelation chapter 8 might already be sounding, and you and I are paying no attention to it, just like the Revelation says. We're not paying attention to it because we really don't believe it's happening. It is happening, my friend. This earth is slowly dying. The sun is dying. I told somebody, Brother Terry, the other day I said there was a time when you water your plants in the morning and you leave it and it's wet all day. Not anymore. The ozone around this planet is depleted daily. And the sun dries up the earth. You've got to water your plant two or three times a day to keep it alive. The earth is spewing man because of his sin out of it. And so I believe that we are seeing trumpet warnings all around and still, we do not seek after God. Still, we think God's a joker. Still, we think church is just a game. Here in Isaiah chapter 24, it says, Behold the Lord. Isaiah did not even know what he was writing about. He just saw vision in his writing. He says, Behold the Lord, maketh the earth empty. You know what he's doing? People are dying by the thousands. The Lord is making the earth empty. He maketh it waste and turneth it upside it down. And scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Mankind is running. Here hurricane is coming. Hurricane season is, is about to start, right? <clears throat> Listen. There's going to come a time when you're on a cruise ship. And your life is in jeopardy. Flaunt yourself. Run with the sinners. Do everything they do and think you're going to get away. You're a child of God. Do what God wants you to do. We're so climatized ourselves with evil in our society. That we don't know how to isolate ourselves. That's why this message is being preached today. And it shall be. Who would be the one that would receive judgment? Let's read it, verse 2. Can you flash that up for me? Isaiah chapter 24, verse 2, 3, and 4, and 5. We'll go up right up to verse 5. Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 24. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. Not only the people, but the preachers. He says, as with the servant... So with the master, as with the maid, so with the mistress, as with the businessman, the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of interest, so with the giver of usury to him. He says, the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken it. You see, what is happening in the world today, all this disaster, do not ignore it. Draw near to God. Pray like you never prayed before. 
Live for God like you have never lived for, for God before. Because when the judgments of God come in the earth, make sure you're not a part of what is receiving that judgment. And he goes on here, he says, The land shall be, verse 4, The earth mourned and faded away. The world languished and faded away. <coughs> And them proud people, you see, I'm driving, I'm driving <clears throat> my old Ford. When you're driving that old Ford, you're driving that Windstar, you know, it rattles. You hope it doesn't hit too much of a rock. If, if my old Ford is not here today, it's parked up. But if that Ford hits a pothole and I move away, a lot of rust is left at the bottom of that pothole. You drive that. And I remember when JJ told me, he says, Grandpa, you're driving this old car and all my friends in school, they've got fancy cars. Their dad's got fancy cars. That's why the Singarati became public, became international. See that man driving his Maserati? Very proud. The bank owns it, but nobody knows. It's leased. He drives his Maserati, the other fancy car, all these fancy cars. People are so proud. Well, you know, I've got all these investments, you know. My life is secure. Listen, I want to tell you something. Nobody's life is secured. Read your Bible again. The biggest collapse of all time is about to happen. When the money market collapses, everything collapses. The Bible says it will happen. The Bible says it will happen. And so when you see earthquakes like they never were before, tornadoes and flooding and snow in areas of the world that is not supposed to have snow, ice in regions that are tropical, the world is rebelling. Here is why. Verse 5. The earth also... Verse 4, the earth mourneth and faded away, the world languisheth and faded away, and the haughty people, the proud, exalted people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because, everybody, because they have transgressed the laws, that's the laws of God, that's not speed signs, this is the laws of God, and change the ordinance, ordinances are changed. Words are redefined in our day. The marriage is no longer an institution set up by God so men can be married to a woman. When mankind is so corrupt that he changed the laws of God, God will judge this world. Listen to me carefully. Because I'm the preacher, right? If I say this thing and it doesn't happen, you can attack me later on. But if God does not judge the city of Toronto, he may have to make an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. And worse than sodomy is rejection of the ministry. Jesus says, when a city rejects you, he says, in the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city that rejects a man sent by God to preach to it. Mankind has transgressed the ordinances. It says, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, hath the curse devoured the earth. And they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. And few men left. May God give you understanding. You got the time. I got the message to preach. Amen. And may God help me. That I might obey it. As much as I expect you to obey it. Let's pray. Father we thank you today. For another warning that you can give to us thank you Lord that your spirit can direct us and your word can mean a lot to us please help us to live to please you Father please help us to walk according to your principles Father not to be exalted but to humble ourselves 
as we desire to serve thee. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. We try to finish church as best as we could by one o'clock to give those traveling by subway an opportunity uh, to get going and those traveling back to Rochester uh, to be able to get home before it's too late. <clears throat> the time we're living in is a very serious time and when we look at uh, the scriptures there's so much so much in the Word of God to give us caution. In Matthew chapter 24 uh, Jesus made a statement and it is so important that we <clears throat> look at some of these things and consider the statements of Scripture and see how best we can apply these areas to our lives. Matthew 24, um, you have a red letter edition Bible, it would have a lot of red in this particular chapter. Um, chapter 23, Jesus ended that, Matthew ended that chapter by telling of how Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he was very sad. And in chapter 23, I think that's where we'll back up to and then move on forward. In chapter 23, Jesus cautioned uh, his people. He had a confrontation with the religious element of his time and he was not a Dale Carnegie type of person even though he would put little children on his knees and, and set them on his lap and, and he would make a statement like suffer little children to come unto me. He was very compassionate and yet at the same time very firm in what he maintained. Matthew chapter 23, he condemns the Pharisees. Uh, he made some statements like this in verse 13. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, I don't know how you'll convert people if they're standing there in front of you listening to you preaching to them, and you call them hypocrites. But he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees were the most religious people in that period of time. And they were the teachers. They were the ones that taught law. They were the ones that conducted an oversight over the, in the synagogues. And he says, For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. In other words, the religious people in any time could be the greatest obstacle for one's spiritual development. I listened to Brother Raleigh today and uh, he has a religious background. He told you about where he came from and where he was heading and the struggles he had in making decisions. Well, we all have religious backgrounds. Uh, my parents, my mom was, my dad was a Hindu originally. My mom, also from a pagan background, religion, uh, she was a Madras, and um, we grew up in more of an Anglican environment because by the time my mom and dad got together, they became Anglicans. And so as a young man, we grew up in Anglican, in the Anglican church. And the reason why my dad decided that we needed to go to Anglican church would be the most amazing reason well they had a big cemetery and if you're a member in the Anglican Church you can get a free plot and so dad joined the Anglican Church took us all so we all he had nine kids plus himself and mom that'll be 11 little plots you can get uh, to be buried uh, he did not realize that the church was the biggest tomb in the cemetery. 
have more dead people inside than outside. But we grew up there and I can condemn the past that I came on because it takes the past to bring me to my present position. I don't curse the bridges I cross on. Might be a lousy bridge, but it brought me to where I am today. And I give God thanks for that. I cannot condemn the men who were my teachers of the past. They might not have known as much as we know today, but they did their jobs in bringing us to where we are. My mom never went to college, but she raised kids. My dad never went to the university, but he knew how to father his children. And so when I look back, Brother Raleigh had a heritage, and I have a heritage. And one day, I was about 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, and I came out of the Anglican church, and I saw the priest with a cigar, cigarette in one hand, a cigarette in his left hand, shaking everybody's hand as they leave the church. His breath smelt alcohol. And a young man, I don't know, I didn't know it was if it was right or wrong to smoke and drink, but I told my mom, I said, Mom, can I go to a different church? And she didn't care. She said, yes, you can. So I wandered from Anglican Church to the Church, Indiana Church of God. And my pastor was there. I used to go around with him. He had a motorcycle and I used to ride behind him. We go for Sunday school and stuff like that. And from Church of God, long story short, I went a little bit to the Pilgrim Holiness. And they had at that time, Brother Cherry might remember, they had something called Youth for Christ. And I was a part of the Youth for Christ uh, group. And then one day I was privileged. I was about 12 years old. And I heard my first Pentecostal message preached to me. There was a, um, it was a community center that was used to house a crusade. And the pastor that was preaching that day, his name was Brother, he never called himself Reverend, but he says Brother Harry Das, an Indian man. And the man that conducted that crusade that night, his name was Dennis Hilliman. I was 12 years old. And when the service came to an end, they asked those who want to accept Jesus into their lives can come forward. I went. And that brought a change in my life from that day on. I became a serious Christian. And when I'm looking back, there's a lot of things I, I embraced. I became a member of the Full Gospel Fellowship of Churches in Guyana. And I appreciate that period of time. I had friends that were all ministers. And there was a time when I was about 21 years old. Just 21 years old. There were 12 little churches in a district I was in charge of. I wasn't married yet. Um, we got married when I was 22 years old. And Chandri was 20 at that time. But I was in charge of that district. Well, you know, there were things that I could never comprehend. I could never understand the doctrine of the Trinity. When... And I had problems in that organization because they said one plus one plus one is equal to one. And they said the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. I couldn't understand that either. Because I thought the Father was the Father, and the Son was a separate entity than the Father, and the Son was lesser in power than the Father, and then he said, my father is greater than I. So I could not understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And so when I asked my pastor in that time, uh, can you explain this to me? He said, it's a mystery. Yeah. Well, last night we had a service that I talked about the mysteries of God. And Jesus said to his disciples, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And so we are here in church today to learn about the mysteries. Uh, they might be things we might never fully understand. But as long as we're here, we'll do our best to try to comprehend what God wants to teach us. And so when it comes to religion, 
I could be there as a religious leader and I don't want you to leave my organization. I don't want you to move ahead to something more that demands more dedication and sacrifice because I want to keep my membership. And that is what the Pharisees were. They wanted to hold on to their people and get this little organization going and do the little mechanics of religion and hope that every member can remain a member. And Jesus was very blunt. He says, you hypocrites. He says, you would not enter in at this, at, at, into the kingdom and people that want to enter in, you hindered them. And so in the very next verse, he said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 14, hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Somebody says, well, I pray very much. Well, if you pray... Uh, how are you praying? Uh, there was a Pharisee and a publican, find that scripture for me, that went into the temple to pray. And uh, Jesus uh, made mention of this. He says this Pharisee and the publican went into a uh, temple to pray. And the Pharisee, the publican bowed his head because he was a sinner. And he said, Lord... Be merciful to me, a sinner. But the Pharisee, he was more self-righteous in that he felt he was a better man uh, before God than the publican was. Somebody find that for me? And um, uh, when the Pharisee prayed, the scripture said the Pharisee who, Pharisee who prayed a longer prayer prayed with himself. You see, you can be saying prayers and not praying prayers. It's two different things. You could be praying in, to impress people around you uh, without sincerely talking to God. And um, have we found that? Luke chapter 18. Okay, thank you, Nadine. I've got it right in, in front of me. But it's always good to, um, to have individuals search their Bibles. And in Luke chapter 18 and verse 10, two men went into the temple to pray. The one, a Pharisee, a religious man, and the other, a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And here is what he said. He's telling God. He says, God, I thank thee. I'm not like other men are. Uh, extortioners. He says, people are robbing people. Out. I'm not like them. He says, unjust, I'm not an unjust man. He says, adulterers, he says, I don't, I'm not an adulterer. He says, and even as this man here, this publican, I'm not like this guy across there, he's a sinner. Now, can you imagine he's telling God all of this? And uh, he says, I fast twice in the week. I give thanks of all things that I, all that I possess and then the Bible says, and the publican, um, standing afar off, he was a sinner, would not lift up as much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know what Jesus says? He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Who went justified? The publican, the sinner, because he was sincere. But this man that was very exalted, and that was the attitude of the Pharisees in that time, because they were religious. Uh, we've got to be careful that we are not branded as the Pharisees of the 21st century. Because we can have so much knowledge and so much understanding of Scripture uh, that uh, it could exalt us. If your religion makes you proud, and exalted, then your religion has done nothing for you. See, Brother Raleigh said he came here to die. He didn't mean he's coming here for Brother Singh to kill him. But what he meant is the carnal nature, the ungodliness in him, the, that which is rejected by God in him, he came here to give that up. And this is important. I'm here to die myself. And I've been dying for the past uh, 60 uh, years uh, you know I've been almost 60 years I've been dying slowly to myself I'm not what I used to be years ago 
I look back at five years ago. I'm not what I was five years ago. I'm not what I was ten years ago. I'm on a journey. And I have a goal before me. And I hope to God.